Hello, this is the RPG Pundit, the final boss in Internet Shitlords, and today I'm faced with a daunting task. I am going to be doing a review of Raiders of Riley uh, from the Tideless Sea, which is, as it's described here, an epic campaign sandbox made for Cthulhu-based RPGs. This is by Quentin Bauer, who is the creator of the Raiders of Riley. Game oh well the Riz Riley RPG. Here's the Game Master's Guide. So to give you a comparison, it is bigger than the actual Game Master's Guide. It's bigger than the Invisible College, which is the largest RPG I ever made. It is not counting some of the back pages, which are considerable. <laughs> uh and let's see here, where does it actually stop? What's the last one that actually has a page count? Got some maps. Okay, so it gets to 537 pages with a bunch of pages extra at the very back. So it's a huge look. Um, before I continue, I should point out that uh, I was a consultant on Raiders of Relier and provided some text that was in the, the rules, um, wrote some material. This was many years ago, and uh, I was paid for that. Uh, however, I have nothing to do with this book. Um, I make no money from it or anything like that. And, of course, I feel like I'll be able to give it a, a fair shake. Now, as far as the video is concerned, it, you know, I like to go meticulously over every part of a review, but if I did that with this book, it would, you know, I probably need like three hours or something. So I'm, I can't really do that just because of the sheer goddamn size of it. It's, it's really remarkable how large a book it is. Right. And essentially what it is, it's, uh, first of all, it's, you know, obviously made as a source book for Raiders of Rallier, but you, you know, the system of Raiders of Rallier is a derivative system of like the, the kind of Cthulhu rules. Uh, you know, the Chaosium type rules. And so this book would definitely be usable if you're running Call of Cthulhu, you know, with the D100 system. Um, it's quite a remarkable piece of work. It has here, as you see, nautical maps. The whole thing is like a seafaring campaign. It's set in 1900, um, an age of imperial intrigues, perilous adventures, and shadowy conspiracies. And and basically the, the presumption is that characters are um, steamship are part of the crew of a steamship in the in you know the, the turn of the last century, exploring forbidden waters, salvaging sunken secrets, and outwitting seafaring scum. Um, it has a variety of new rules. Uh, I'm quoting here from the introduction, right? Um, and toolkits for operating merchant steamships and leading crews navigating to faraway ports and lost worlds, running trades and missions in a foreign hostile territory handling adventures in mysterious ports of call, battling seafaring cults and other menaces, human and inhuman, hidden across the globe, and investigating an existential and conspiratorial threat overshadowing the world. Um, so, you know, uh, it makes me think, for example, that let's say if you're the type of person that enjoys the Traveler RPG, you know, this sci-fi, famous sci-fi RPG where you play basically like people on a starship seeking their fortune through space. Well, this is kind of similar in a way to that, in that you are um, on a boat, right? <laughs> in the, the, you know, still fairly wild, um, what passed for civilization at the beginning of the last century. Um, so we're talking about, you know, years before World War I. Um, and so you get... Uh, there are a number of chapters involved. Um, the uh, first part is, you know, some of the basics about ships. You can see there's some illustrations. There's a number of different, you know, um, options in terms of like statting out ships, boat types. It's very detailed. Um, it's got some some interesting illustrations. Um you can see that it's got, you know, stuff on artillery. Um, so naval combat stuff. Lots of very good, like, photographic 
highlights. Um, it's quite neat. Uh, the research that went into this must have been astounding. You have like options for investments and upgrades to your boat. Um, all kinds of interesting stuff like that. Um, stuff about like ship life, the type of people that you need on a ship, like the officers. But then also, you know, stuff about like creating an ensemble cast of rogues. Basically, like, you know, there was in this time period, you had a lot of these like very small operations. This was at a time when there were still a lot of people that could make a, a, a decent enough living operating one, you know, rickety or not so rickety steamboat, you know. Um, so you have specific professions that you can choose. Um, rates of pay and skill points and stuff like that, uh, personnel on the ship. So there's, uh, you know, a whole area that gives you all kinds of mechanics that govern what to do. Um, stuff on like poisons that were common in the area, diseases and things like that. Um, like, I mean, you could technically use this, let's say you didn't want to have anything supernatural at all. You could do it as like, uh, in a way, a kind of pulp adventure. Because Razor Riley, one of the things it does is, that makes it different from Call of Cthulhu is that uh, Call of Cthulhu has this kind of thing where you're, you know, like the default is that you're a group of kind of dilettante or professors that are doing investigation into the occult and are usually, you know, not especially tough people, but you're like, you know, doing detective work in a way to try to find these Cthulhu conspiracies. Whereas in Raiders of Riley assumes that you're like tough guys. It's a pulp version of Cthulhu. And, uh, you know, obviously seafaring men in this era had to be tough guys. Uh, so there's all kinds of like different special, Oh, here comes meatball, different special events that can take place that will affect. Oh, there goes meatball. That will affect, uh, you know, your, your situation on the ship. Um, and there's all kinds of stuff here to handle different sorts of missions and activities. Um, types of cargo you could be carrying. Um, all kinds of special rules and tables that govern this sort of stuff. Um, and then you get to, you know, chapter five is on campaign creation. So it gives you stuff like how to have like stock locations, factions, generating special factions. So here's an example of a, of a layout for a, for a faction of a, of a, um, organization. Um, then you have like uh, different like agendas and objectives that these different groups could have. Um, so there's lots of, it's not just flavor, right? There's a lot of mechanical stuff and it goes beyond just kind of like, well, meatball, you can't get right on top of the book. I can't, I can't do the review when you're there. <laughs> I know it's a, it's like an awesome book to sit on, right? Besides everything else, your cat will enjoy sitting on this book. Come here, goofball. Hey, but you can't be sitting on the book. I'm, it's hard enough to review a gigantic book like this when you're trying to sit on it. How about you sit on The Invisible College instead? It's a pretty good book. All right. So <laughs> she's determined to sit on the book. Uh, so lots of different factional material, um, assets, uh, different kind of locations for groups, bases of operations, stuff like that. Um, mythos objects. Uh, specialists of different sorts. So you got enormous resources. You have timeline events that are, you know, you can create a campaign timeline or use random events that occur during the campaign to shake things up a bit. Um... So lots of lots of great material for setting up the campaign, set piece environments, to, you know, urban, coastal, etc. Monster islands. Uh, it's quite an amazing source book <laughs> in in terms of like you know huge amounts of of thought and research have been put into this. Um, you know, I, I, I'm obviously a guy who loves a well-made setting. And for me, a well-made setting 
has to have uh, a lot of playable material. It has to have like, you know, um, ideally multiple concepts that can be followed inside a campaign, right? So like, I don't know, like in, in Dark Albion, you can be a group of, you know, mercenaries or wandering adventurers, or you can be part of the, the you know, circle of a, of a noble player character or NPC. You could work for the clerical order. You could get involved directly in the, in the Rose War, et cetera, right? So there's multiple options. And here there are as well, right? Because depending on the type of ship you have, depending on whether the group's focus is mostly on making a living or if they're like, you know, plying the seas looking for action or if they're, you know, actively involved in hunting down Cthulhu cults and not, and it's not just something uh, that, that they end up running into in the course of the campaign. There are lots of ways to frame the campaign basically. Right. Um, so as you can see, enormous amounts of resources and a good mix of like, um, let's say raw data about the setting period and stuff like that and random tables and generators. So um, quite impressive. Next you get like port creation rules that allows you to, to, um, you know, uh, establish a context of any different type of port that you go to so that, you know, different areas will, Different locations will have each their own style and themes. Very good stuff. Rules on like port authority, etc., bribes, consular services, diplomacy, the whole deal. Meatball's now sitting on my knee. <laughs> um, and uh, you get, uh, you know, it's just tons, tons and tons of stuff. Uh, this is This is something at the kind of epic level of like the great Pendragon campaign or something like that. It's a massive detailed campaign book that would have like, you know, it, it would be impossible to use everything in here in a single campaign. Right. So it's, it's something that you can return to again and again. And the variability of, you know, these generators and tables means that, that uh, you can make things different every time. Right. Um, so you have a list of, of ports of call of the era um, with their like general area, population, you know, all as it was in 1900. Then you have like rules for making missions, as to say, basically adventures um, with like objectives, threats, etc. Some of this is stuff that, you know, some DMs are not going to want to use the all of the framework that is provided here but then you know you don't have to right but if you if you want to assist yourself in in generating a framework it's all there right uh next we get into a chapter that's directly about cthulhu stuff you know um now i've been on record as saying that i'm kind of over cthulhu you know like uh, at this point you know if i'm going to run something with with sinister supernatural things i'm going to use the invisible college which is not based in any way on the mythos but rather on you know um actual stuff from occultism uh but i mean i could certainly imagine running a invisible college 1900 campaign where, where people are you know plying the seas in in steamboats you know like that could be certainly a a, a, a mobile uh hall of the invisible college seeking out uh, enemies in different ports of call, right? So you got, you know, monster stats for different types of, uh, of Cthulhu entities um, and all kinds of different qualities that they might have. Then you get to the world source book. And here, as you see, you'll get detailed information about specific ports of call uh, that were like usually important ones of the era, you know, um, landmarks and uh, history, archaeological stuff, anthropological stuff, all of which can, you know, tie into the mythos, right? Um, Howard Carter, the archaeologist. Um, so lots and lots of detail there. It's uh, really an astounding product. I mean, of course, you have like Innsmouth, right? So it's not it's not entirely historical because it also adds in stuff that is part of the Cthulhu mythos lore, you know, uh, like those those mysterious places. Um, 
Bangkok, you know, all a whole bunch of, of actual locations, Boston, that you can use. I mean, we're only on the bees, right? <laughs> so uh, there's, uh, it's really quite remarkable, uh, all of the material that you get. And it, it provides this great mix of like historical detail and then how to incorporate the mythos into that in different locations, you know. Um, so I would say this is a, a, a very, very impressive book. Um, Gibraltar. Um, and, you know, we're only like on page 376 here. And I've been like paging through it like mad, right? So uh, very big world source book section. Um, let's get past it here. Uh, no, still on it. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if this is the sort of thing, like this kind of historical campaign or, you know, Cthulhu campaign would appeal to you, you know, like this is, uh, let's put it this way, right? Chaosium has, is well past its prime at this point. It's gone woke. It, uh, it also, um, has just lost like there was there was a time when Chaosium made some of the best campaign and adventure books in the world, right? This is a map of New Orleans at the time. Um and this is like we are long past that that period, right? Here's Manhattan, obviously. Um you know, there's a there's there's adventure points in, in a lot of these locations. Um, so, you know, like this is a book that is, that has like, you know, like a, you think of like some of the best stuff that, that Chaosium ever made, like, uh, you know, Horror on the Orient Express, uh, Masks of Nyarlathotep, especially. I mean, you think of Mar Masks of Nyarlathotep that highlights details of like four or five specific locations in the world, in this world spanning adventure. Um, and like, this is just that at a scale that that chaosium never attempted you know providence rose island um it is pretty astounding uh, i'd say extremely astounding you know um so uh you know obviously it's not going to be for everyone because for some people this is like too much campaign for them to handle i guess you could say um, but I mean, again, you're not never going to use everything that's in the book in a campaign unless you're, I mean, I mean, may, maybe if you run a campaign the last years and years, you might end up using a, a very significant percentage of it. But the point is that it all being there, right. First as a historical book, it's, it's remarkable. And second, as, uh, you know, something as a campaign book, the resources that you have, like just presented for you you know, uh, right up front is pretty spectacular, right? So now we've gotten past the source book and we're at the area where you have like additional details, right? So like you've got, you know, stats for, you know, basically different types of humans, intelligence officers, police, etc. cetera, uh, firearms table, um, or weapons references, you know, normal creatures like Nile crocodiles or, you know, African elephants or whatever. Um, some Mexican revolutionaries there, apparently. <laughs> um, world guides to world currencies at the time. You know, like there's all these reference matters and it's like a list of nautical terms. If you want to get all authentic on like even the talking, then a, a big timeline of the history of seafaring, right? Starting around 1866 to um, 1901, uh, 1903. So it gives you like, if you're starting a campaign in 1900, you have like a future timeline here of important naval events. And then we get to the, to the end, you got a detailed bibliography, world maps, and a variety of like, um, character sheets and ship creation sheets and all of that stuff, um, including the detail, like a pre-made ship and uh, some 
characters that you could just ready use if you didn't want to actually bother with character creation. So again, uh, this is not a, a an RPG itself. It's a it's a campaign book and source book, which you can use with uh, Raiders of of Relia or with Call of Cthulhu or with you know um, there are several like. Um, you know the equivalent of OSR style like systems that are that are derived from the D100 system that that are essentially made to be compatible with the the Chaosium system that you could probably run this with. So there you are. I've managed to get in about twenty minutes. The best I can do within the span of my typical videos uh, of what Raiders of Riley from the Titleist Sea is about. I think it's an incredibly worthy book. Um, it is something for people, you know, who are huge fans of, of campaign books, um, will love reading it. And if you want, you know, if you want to have, uh, a detailed setup campaign there with this kind of thematic of, I mean, I, I mean, technically you could probably use it for other kinds of Cthulhu adventures as well. Like, I mean, you could pick an, an area or a single city or whatever, and have people just working there or, or having a group of item, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to be yourselves, the the people running a boat, right? You could have a group of people that are traveling the world, which back then you would travel the world by ship, right? And so you could be going to all these different ports of call or what have you, right? There's lots of ways you could frame an adventure or a campaign in uh, from the Tideless Sea. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an, an, a very impressive book. It certainly is an epic sandbox campaign, exactly what it says in the cover. And uh, if this is the kind of thing you like, you're going to really, really enjoy it. And uh, I guess that's that's basically what I have to say about it. Um, if you like this video, please hit the like button, and share the video anywhere that you think people will find it interesting. I doubt anyone will, you know, be offended by this video in particular, but share it anyway. And uh, you know, if you, uh, I'll put put a link to where you can get from the title of C. Uh, so you can purchase it if you like. And of course, if you check, that'll be in the description of this video. And also in the description are links to all my products, stuff like the Invisible College or uh, the Gonzo Fantasy Companion. Um, certainly the Invisible College could be combined with this source book. I'll, I mean, it's not Chaosium System, so you'd have to do a bit of conversion. But in terms of a reference for if you wanted to play the Invisible College at the turn of the last century instead of in the present day. That would be a very interesting sort of twist, I would think. Um, so check out all my stuff, all my products. There's more stuff to come soon. I hear from Mad Scribe that um, very, very soon we'll have the Heroes and Villains of the Silk Road book out, which is a another kind of um, epic book detailing the uh, expanding the timeline of, or rather filling in parts of the timeline of the the Sword and Caravan campaign and providing detailed biographies of, of these actual historical characters from the uh, that are referenced in Sword and Caravan. And uh, anyways, check out all of my products. Um, it's a great way to support me and my channel and the, you know, the, the work I do in, uh, in uh, the RPG hobby, telling it like it is. Uh, but uh, you also get stuff that you can actually run. So be sure to check all that out. And yeah, uh, if, if, this, if any part of this video was appealing to you, I don't think you're going to be disappointed with uh, this book. And uh, that's everything for today. Currently smoking, Stanwell 2019 Pipe of the Year, plus somewhere down there near the bottom is uh, Argento Roots.